Good morning. How are y'all today? I love time change weekend. It's a good one. At least this one is in the spring. Y'all have a different understanding of what that means. And so we're glad that y'all are here. Glad you survived the rain. Didn't melt. Glad you're here. And uh, my name is Rick Ivey. I'm one of the pastors. If you're visiting, like Tommy said, make sure you sign in with a QR code or I'll be happy to meet you after the service as well. And uh, this morning, we are moving on into talking about um, what we are going to be doing in the upcoming year, uh, 2025, and talk about how you can be a part of that. And the scripture that we're going to look at this morning is from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. You can follow along on your phone or in your Bible. It'll also be on the screen. So here's, here's Paul's word to that early church. He says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one who says, Jesus is Lord, except by the work of the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And that last verse is where we're going to spend some time today. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And so Paul is um, writing to the church in Corinth, and they have run into a number of troubles uh, early on in their life. They're trying to be a revolutionary community. They're trying to offer the world something different, uh, to offer the world Christ and the way of living that Christ had called them to. And the early church has run into a number of problems. Um, In the chapter right before this one, he is addressed to them and he said, rather than eating the Lord's Supper when you come together, when you celebrate communion, you're you're in fact eating the idiot's supper. That's direct translation. Uh, The idiot's supper and uh, he points out to, he says, when the wealthy people in the community, you know, they could, they didn't have to work or they got off of work early, they would come to the community meals and they would eat all the food so that people who had to work longer would show up and there'd be nothing but the, I don't know, parsley and the honeydew. That seems to be what's left over in big dinners. And, uh, and he says, that's not how it should be. You know, y'all need to wait on each other if you're starving eat some food before you come and uh, leave some for for the other people and uh, he writes to them and after the chapter we read you've got the the verse that it's present at almost every wedding about what love is love is patient love is kind and you can have all the kinds of mystical gifts you can imagine but if you don't have love then what good does it do And so sandwiched in between those realities of what the Lord's Supper should be and what love should look like, Paul writes this passage about spiritual gifts. And so if you're kind of new to the church and you've never heard anything about this, I would encourage you to take the time to research that, look into that. What are spiritual gifts? Uh, There's a variety of ways you can address them. Probably the quickest way you can start to figure those out is through prayer, build a prayer habit, read scripture, be a part of a Sunday school class or a group of some kind, and sooner enough you'll start to understand what your spiritual gifts are. And so he writes to them and wants to talk with them, and the confusion uh, revolves around the matter that there's a wide variety of spiritual gifts. Uh, and in this particular chapter, he names two of them about prophecy and about preaching and about service and about uh, healing and mercy and a number of other spiritual gifts and the problem that he runs into is that there's one particular spiritual gift the gift of speaking in tongues or speaking in another language or angelic uh, pattern of language whatever you want to talk about he says that one's kind of become a uh, a favorite for this particular community and he's talking to them and he's saying you know Uh, There's a variety, there's a long variety of spiritual gifts, and y'all are focused in on this one spiritual gift known as speaking in tongues. And so he addresses it, and he says, "You, you can't all have that particular gift, and it shouldn't be looked at as more important than the others that are there, right? To kind of summarize the 
point that Paul is making, you know, he, he does it a variety of ways. But in our terms, it would be like we can't have a successful football team if all we've got are 30 deep snappers and one receiver, right? You know, you've got to have a variety. You've got to be present in our world. And uh, he, he makes it very clear. He says that one particular gift shouldn't overshadow the others. We need all the gifts. They all have to show up. And they're all meant for what? Remember that last verse? He says they're all for the building up of the church and for the common good. Given for the common good. So that's what he's talking about. He's, and we have this situation where we need each and every person in the church. You and I, when we look around the room, we need the gifts of everybody that's here. Everybody that's here, even if you're a visitor, we we need you to be a part of the church. We want for you to be a member of the church and to contribute your gifts uh, to make sure that you have not only contributing your spiritual gifts, but financial gifts, the gifts of your time, uh, your abilities, your skills. They are all an essential part of what we do here as a people, a community of God. They're all valuable. They're all important. And so as you think about your own life, I'll just ask you the simple question. Are you contributing to the life of the congregation? Are you finding ways to use your gifts to enrich our time together in worship or in smaller group community or service or any number of ways? Are you finding ways to use your gifts? Paul has a very harsh statement here. In uh, verse 3, he writes to them and he says, um, Therefore, I want you to know that no one is speaking Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one who says, Jesus is Lord. And we don't know if there was anybody in Paul's life who actually said, Jesus be cursed, but he's pointing out and he's saying, it's the work of God's grace, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, that when we get to a place where we proclaim, Jesus is Lord, no longer do we consider Christ to be just a teacher among other teachers, or a person among other persons, or somebody that we look to for just a little bit of guidance or a little bit of wisdom when he says jesus is lord he's saying overall over all authorities all all rulers all principalities everything jesus is lord over all those things and it would have been a radical political statement back in paul's time the leading slogan at that time was caesar was lord and so paul is claiming it and he's saying you know by the work of god's grace by the presence of Christ in our world, by the, the work of God in our hearts and our lives, we get to a point where we say, Jesus is Lord, and all that we have, everything that we can contribute belongs to Him, right? And that's our gifts, everything that we have belongs to Christ. And so if that's not where you're at today, I would just encourage you to pray about that, to spend some time with God and say, why is it that I'm at a spot where I'm not recognizing Christ's lordship in my life, where I'm not spending time and devotion and giving all that I am into his life. Why is it that I'm still struggling there? What is it that I need to let go of? Or how do I need to rethink my life so that I can grow closer to who Christ is? And he says all these gifts, everything that God gives us, every blessing that he pours out into our life, everything that we are given by God belongs to God and is there for the giving of the common good to contribute and to be a part of what God is doing in the life of the church and the life of our world, that we are invited to do that. And so when you, you look at that passage and the others that are around it, you begin to get a, a bigger picture of what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus, right? To recognize him as Lord, to recognize him as our Savior and to worship and to give all that we are to him and that it's a whole different way of of living than what our world is used to i mean usually when we talk about your your gifts your abilities your skills what you've achieved we usually talk about it in terms of how you might use that to gain more or to get more or to be more right somewhere in that community when somebody had the gift of speaking in tongues they were looked at and they were thought like Wow, they're like all-stars of the church. They have that, that one gift that everybody seems to want, right? There's that way of looking at your gifts and saying, this is just for me, this is for my glory, my success, my gain. Um, but that's not what Jesus had in mind 
or what the Holy Spirit has in mind when we are gifted, when we're given abilities. Rather, it's supposed to be for the common good. And so I want to just consider that for a moment, that reality and that shift that Jesus calls us to and invites us to. I mean, like I said, we live in a world where the rich get richer, the powerful get more powerful, and Jesus had a whole different way of looking at the world, a whole different way of imagining how the world might get better, how the world might find salvation. And so let's just remember the story that's in our gospel. I mean, one of the most rich and powerful people that we hear about in the Bible is a guy named King Herod, and he had the political power and the the wealth, and what did he do with it? He didn't use it to the benefit of his people. He didn't use it to help other people. He used his wealth and his power to have lavish parties, right? We read about it earlier this year. Have lavish parties and enjoy uh, having all those things. That's what he did with his gifts and what he had been given. Used it for political gain. Used it to secure his own situation. And then uh, you have somebody completely in contrast to that. You have Jesus, right? One of Jesus' most famous miracles, the one that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of those, one of those famous things that he did was give bread, right? Give bread and fish. It's one of the most miraculous things that he does in the Bible. He takes the little Hebrew lunchable, loaves and fish, and turns it into a vast multitude of feeding, a vast multitude of people. Uh, He takes the bread, blesses it, gives thanks to God, and somehow more than enough for the people that are gathered there with even some scraps left over for for later. He shocks the disciples who said, you know, go send them off to go find some food. He says, you give them something to eat. And all of a sudden, there's more than enough. And, you know, nothing has changed when you take a group of hungry people and you feed them in abundance. They do. They want to eat you king, Right? And that's what happened to Jesus. They, you can read the story yourself. Afterwards, they come to him and they say, hey, you give the good bread, you give the free bread, we want to make you king, right? And um, instead of that, Jesus could have had them, the thousands of people that are there go and siege Jerusalem or take on the Roman army or do whatever he wanted as long as the bread kept coming, right? And instead of that, he gets on a little boat with his disciples, goes across, and he because that is not how he did things. Right? And he could have, any way along the way, used his power, used his ability, used his influence to become king or to have military authority or to secure a safe position in life, however you want to look at it, but he never did that. In fact, when the last week of his life, when he gathered together with his disciples, he had the last meal with them, the last supper, and he said, this is my body given for you, my blood poured out for you, uh, all heaven given to him, and he used it all to help others, to make a difference in the world, right? And then... I mean, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion in a moment, but y'all remember what he did after the supper? We're not going to do this, but what did he do? He washed feet, right? Took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he got down on his hands and knees, and he washed his disciples' feet, right? One by one, and Peter was shocked. He's like, Lord, don't, I don't, don't touch my feet, right? Uh, he, but they, he said, you know, unless you let me wash your feet, you can't be my disciple and he got down on his hands and knees and he washed their feet and I don't know I mean think about that for a moment Um, hygiene was not what it was today right and more than that many of them didn't have shoes or wore sandals and so you're talking about some pretty gnarly feet at that point right and then you add to it what else he knew Judas was going to betray him knew Peter was going to be cowardly knew the disciples' problems, and his response was to wash their feet, to get down there and deal with Judas's toe jam, right? Deal with Peter's fungus, whatever he had going on, right? Wash their feet. And then he said, you used to call me Lord, teacher, but now you're my 
friends. And when you take that and you say the, the way the world does things is not the way that Jesus does things. The way that the world looks at power or wealth or authority is not the way that Jesus looks at those things at all. I mean, I don't know about you, but I hope and pray whoever gets elected this week, all the officials, all the people are more like Jesus than they are like Herod. I sure hope that they are people who put others first, who put the needs of the greater good first before their own, who don't use it for their own political gain or their own advantage, but rather, like Jesus, find ways to serve and make the world better because that's the only way we're going to get out of the mess that we're in, right? And so Jesus invited them to the table, made them welcome, washed their feet. And no, any way along the way, Jesus could have called on them to be his servant or to take authority or to take a power. But instead, he said, I give you my body, my blood, all that I am, and went to the cross for us and for our salvation so that we could know the kind of freedom that makes us new creations with new gifts, spiritual gifts, meant for the good of the body of Christ. So today, I, I invite you, as we pause and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, to remember that you are somebody who has gifts that are meant for the good of your church. You are somebody that has spiritual gifts that are meant to build and enrich the body of Christ, whether that's teaching or leading or being in administration or maybe you have a word from God or maybe you have gifts for healing or any of those things, all of those are for the good of the body of Christ, for the building up and the enriching of what we do here as a community of people. And I call on you to continue to pray and to rekindle those and to discover them and to find ways to make them be a part of what we're doing as a community because they make all the difference and they are essential. The other thing I want to talk with you about today is just simply that as we go through communion this morning, we're going to be reading off the, the names of all those saints that have joined the church triumphant, those that have gone on before us. And um, as I read through the list this week, I was just reminded of all the wonderful people that have been part of Wesley Methodist Church who gave decades of their lives to make a difference for the, this church that we have here, this wonderful community that we're a part of. And they all knew and understood that their gifts belong to building up the common good.